You're going to have to infiltrate CBI and give us everything. Especially Tommy Egan. I'll do it. I'll help you take him down. For Season 2, Episode 5 explored the theme of family and how it can both heal and also destroy. At the heart of this episode, we witnessed Tommy struggling to protect DMAC from following that the same path of his nephew, Tariq St. Patrick. The writers exposed the complex dynamic of tough love, which is a stark reminder that sometimes, protecting our loved ones does mean making the hardest of decisions. Unfortunately, this decision also led to Kate Egan's heartbreaking relapse. Kate falling back into the drug she is so used to depend on does serve as a reminder of the harsh reality many addicts face. DMAC gave her motivation to live a pure and a sober life. He was her strength. But the writers really did a great job in portraying the relentless grip that addiction can have in more ways than one, and how external factors can throw you back to your old ways. The tragedy of Diamond and Janard's father unexpectedly reunited the two brothers, which also showcased the powerful bond family can have in face of adversity. It's a reminder that family can heal and rebuild bridges that seem to have been completely burned. But this episode of Force wasn't just about family reunions and love. This episode dived deep into the darkest of corners of human nature, it was Claudia Flynn's betrayal and a theme we're all too familiar with in power. She was a devil dressed in red, and her quest for power and control over the Flynn organization gave us a chilling reminder what lengths some are willing to go to to achieve that power, powder, and respect. This episode picked up with the aftermath of DMAT killing a cop. He was in complete panic mode because he knows the consequences of what he'd just done. If law enforcement found out he'd killed a cop, then they'd throw the book at him. But he also did what he had to do because I do feel Seamus was out of control. However, he had to let Tommy and Diamond deal with the aftermath and Tommy must have been thinking one thing. Ah oh, shit, here we go again. With Jannard, he was asking his crew to reach out to a connect named Yo-Yo to see if he could front him two bricks. But his crew told him to his face. Yo-Yo isn't doing business with him because he doesn't do business with those who get high on their own supply. Bradley said something had to be done and they had to reevaluate their situation. But Jannard pleads with his crew which shows how desperate he was. Jannard was down bad and it was only gonna get worse. As Diamond sat in his local, he learned how Big C, his father, was in hospice. However, his quiet morning was interrupted by former members of Treason who had flipped over to the RDs. And unfortunately, an innocent woman was caught in the crossfire. Another stark reminder that innocent bystanders always run the risk of getting caught in the middle of this unforgiving world. As she was rushed to hospital, Maria's glowing smile soon turned upside down. Earlier in the season, Maria said one of the reasons why she loves her job is because she gets to give patient good news, and I'm sure she loves seeing the smile on people's faces. But this was the other side. Sometimes in life, it doesn't go always as planned, and you have to take the good with the bad. Now, as she broke up with Kendall, Miguel saw him put his hands on his sister, and I think we all knew what was going to happen next. As we all know, the Garcias are huge on family, which goes back to the theme of this episode and this particular video, family, love, and betrayal. Miguel Garcia was certainly going to make Kendall pay for putting hands on his sister. What we saw play out was brutal, with Miguel hurting both of Kendall's hands. But the question I'm going to pose is, will this be the catalyst for Maria to slowly turn against her brother? I raised the theory about her potentially using Miguel's diabetes against him, and if he continues meddling in her personal life, then we may come across a scenario where she really does turn against her own blood. Now the city was crawling with cops, and Tommy was paranoid because he thought they may have just found Seamus' body, but Diamond got him up to speed and gave him a history lesson which dates back to 1994. The RDs and the CBI used to be one, but they've been beefing ever since 94 since the first split happened. Now Diamond was in the joint with the leader of the RDs, who goes by the name King Kilo, and they spoke about a coalition which only sounded like a fantasy at the time, but something they may want to consider. He also questioned Tommy about what he did with DMAC, and Tommy couldn't believe it when he turned around. He didn't just defy strict orders to stay indoors, he was out with Marshall and also talking to cops. Tommy took DMAC home and grabbed him just like he's done with Tariq in the past. He told him not to talk to anyone or leave the home, which does cause conflict with JP. But here's where Tommy sounded a bit like Ghost. The less he knew about the situation, the better. Ghost always used to say, he's got this, he's got this under control. And never used to paint the full picture of what happened or what his next moves were. But Ghost also used to do it to protect Tommy and his family. And now that Tommy has a family of his own, he really is facing similar situations. So ironically, he is having to do the same. Stuck at home, DMAC was bored and losing his mind. Genesis not texting him back wasn't helping either. And so he opens up to his grandmother, but here's where it showed how much of a soft spot Kate Egan has for DMAC. 
Despite Tommy giving him strict orders, stay indoors. Kay gave him a 20 and told him, do what you need to do, and she'll deal with Tommy. But little did they both know, the decision would completely change the course of their future for both of them. Diamond warned Tommy that he was going to have to do something about DMAC, and he knew what had to be done. He opened up to JP about how he killed a cop, which did cause a bit of conflict between JP and Tommy. JP blamed Tommy for bringing this to their doorstep, but rightfully so, he reminded him that he's been in this life from the beginning. But they also had to end this and there was only one way. He had Big Smurf kidnap DMAC and he warned JP, do not tell Kate. Nobody knew Kate better than Tommy, although this is a new Kate Egan we're seeing in season 2 of Force. She's been sober for 10 days plus. But as I mentioned before, the strength and motivation was her grandson. She had a new opportunity to do right by him, something which she failed with JP and Tommy. Now, as she began to question where DMAC was, she feared the worst, which I really don't blame her for. She knows very well what Tommy is capable of and how much of a monster he is, which is where Kate said she raised monsters, but the truth is, she didn't raise them. We also saw the fear in her eyes because she knew Tommy's already killed one of his parents, Tony Teresi, and so can we blame her for having this heartbreaking reaction? What we saw next was really sad to see, but also the reality of people trying to come out of drug addiction. It just takes one thing to trigger you, and with DMAC giving her a purpose to fight this long life habit, as soon as he was taken away from her, she turned to the drug she so used to depend on. Now having said that, this also shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone. In Ghost Season 3, which is ahead of the Force timeline, we did see Kay Egan drinking alcohol, so a relapse was always on the cards at some stage of Season 2 of Force. I've been asking a question for a while now, will DMAC get the Tariq treatment, and he has, but it is different to being hung off a roof. He's been sent to a youth academy in the middle of nowhere, just surrounded by fields, horses, and cows. But Tommy did this out of tough love, which goes back to the theme of family dynamics. Just before hanging up the phone, he went to tell him that he loves him, but he stopped short. And you could tell he didn't want to make this decision, but he also felt as if he had to because of what he's seen and been through with his other nephew in the past. So with that being said, will this work? And will DMAX stay here or will he continue to defy his uncle Tommy? With Jannard, I mentioned he was in a desperate state, and desperate people do make desperate moves. Miguel Garcia wasn't doing any business with him and another connect that goes by the name of Yo-Yo wasn't either and Mekovic's payment was overdue so he strolled into the Crimson Projects and attacked Manny, stealing two bricks as well as their chain. He then gives the bricks to his crew and lies to them he got the bricks from Miguel Garcia which we all know isn't the case and I think Bradley had a hunch too. Now intertwined with Jannard and Diamond's story was their father. Jess told him men go through what they go through and he may have a history with Big C but he did deserve a goodbye. He initially reached out to Jannard but then rang Shanti to give him the news instead. Now Shanti really is a boss and I'm just waiting for her to make her move, especially because she did recognize Jannard is not quite right. I can see her taking over treason at some point in the future because 1. Jannard is out of control and 2. He is going to go back to the CBI which would leave a vacant position for treason unless they all move over to the CBI. But again, the question is would Shanti? Now, we later saw Diamond visiting his father where they both deliver some home truths. Big C blamed Diamond for the way Jannard is in the street game, and you could tell there is a lot of bad blood between them. Big C left Diamond and Jannard when they were younger, and they never had a real relationship growing up. Jannard also stopped short when he saw a glimpse of Diamond and then turned to heroin, this time giving up Manny's chain and taking that lethal step in injecting heroin. Unfortunately, while he was busy getting a high, Big C passed, but not without a dying declaration. He wanted Diamond to look out for his brother. Tommy also told him despite them not having a relationship with their father, at the end of the day, he is family. And so Big C's death did put a lot of perspective on their current situation. It'd be great to have you back at CBI. Yeah. Yeah. Now the issues that Diamond will have to deal with if Jannard is back working with the CBI could be their business relationship with Miguel Garcia. The issues that Jannard has with Merkovic also won't go away, so Tommy and Diamond will inherit the problems with Merkovic. There's also his drug addiction and also stealing two bricks from Manny along with a chain which is now in the hands of a druggie on the street. So Jannard will have to put in a lot of work to earn that respect back from those within CBI. Elsewhere, before we move over to the Flynn storyline, Diamond and King Kilo did come to an agreement after Tommy agreed that it was the best way to avoid any more bloodshed, but they did have to give up half of their business in the joint. Now over to the Flynn's which started with Vic. He organized a meal which was a setup to allow Dublin to eliminate Walter Flynn. However, he was picked up by law enforcement who brought him in as they had two eyewitnesses saying he killed Colin in season 1. 
They had him for first degree murder, which would have handed him a life sentence without parole, but they wanted the shark, Tommy Egan. Now Vic stays strong and Stacy Marks ordered Detective Sang to let him go. Now just on a side note, there has been an internal conflict brewing within law enforcement between Sang and Marks. You can clearly tell the tension has been building between them, and it is something similar to that what we saw with the previous task force in power. Despite them wanting to achieve the same goal, they all have different ways and methods, which will always create conflict. So Sang may be one to watch the deeper we get into the series. Now, Stacy Marks wanted to let Vic go because he's the one that could help them bring down Tommy Egan, especially because they worked together before. Now it was a risk, but it was a calculated chess move from Stacy Marks, which did actually pay dividends later on. You play chess while everyone else is playing checkers. Vic, Claudia and Doyle came together at Claudia's apartment to run through their plan to take down Walter Flynn, and Doyle had drafted the apocalypse from Dublin, which Claudia rightfully questioned. We heard it before with the four horsemen, who were dispatched with ease, so she was right to question his ability to get the job done. Now, their plan was a sit-down meal with Walter Flynn and Vic at 8pm, but shortly before 9, Vic was set to leave. The apocalypse and his team would then enter and take out Walter Flynn, and so it was said, Walter Flynn was dying tonight. Now, here's where Claudia started to put her sinister plan in motion. We all know the reason why Claudia really is sleeping with Doyle is because she wanted to lead the Flynn family organization. It's why she was making the moves with Merkovich and the Serbs in episode 4. She's also a chess player just like Stacey Marks, and she was putting everything in motion for when she took over. But Doyle made it known for as long as Vic was alive, she would never be the queen, because Dublin would never have a female running their operation in Chicago. Doyle then tells Claudia the timeline had been pushed up to 8.30pm and not 9, and that was due to the fog, so she said she'd inform Vic. Unfortunately, what Claudia didn't know was, Uncle Paulie had apologised to Walter, and he was also invited to dinner, which Vic did make her aware of. Now, this was the chance to tell Vic that the plan had been moved up to 8.30, but she didn't, and so her intentions had become clear. As Walter, Uncle Paulie and Vic have a family meal, it was all smiles until the sounds of gunshots, which even took Vic by surprise because it was half an hour earlier than he expected, and so Dublin had come calling. We then saw Walter Flynn and Uncle Paulie spring into action. They opened a secret door which had a hell of a lot of firepower. Now, as Walter goes to check on a locked door, Uncle Paulie tells Vic even if it costs him his life, he would sacrifice him for Walter and for him, because at the end of the day, they were family. Walter Flynn also told his son to keep his head down, but he couldn't afford to. He knew his life was in danger as much as theirs. Now, Uncle Paulie did take down a few soldiers from Dublin and goes down fighting, which really was sad to see, especially as he sacrificed his life for someone who had been nothing but ungrateful. We then saw Walter Flynn coming up against the Apocalypse, who he dispatched of after he took a bullet to the leg. It was a bloodbath. Bodies were everywhere and the only two survivors were Vic and Walter Flynn. But Walter knew exactly who was behind the hit. He said Claudia did this because Paulie did see her with Doyle, but Vic bites back and tells him he did this. He killed Gloria and he was the one that made the decisions which led to this moment, which I do find it hard to disagree with. Everything does stem from the stubbornness of Walter Flynn, which dates back to early season 1. He lied, manipulated, and tried to play the kids against each other. He set up Gloria to die, and when Vic was a wreck, he used Claudia. We also heard how he used to treat their mother, which we only had in one conversation between Claudia and Vic. So I do agree Walter Flynn did bring this on himself, but as he told Vic that he should have stuck with his sister because she had more heart, and also how he was pathetic, Vic put a bullet in the back of his father. He then let him know he and Claudia betrayed him together, and as Walter Flynn told him he had his mother's eyes, he asked him, pull the trigger. As it dawned on Vic what Claudia had done, all eyes were on his next move. He turns up to the house which took Claudia by surprise. Doyle then tells him that the hit was moved up by half an hour, and Claudia completely twisted his story and blamed Doyle, but before he could defend himself, she pulled the trigger on Doyle, and as we all know, a dead man can't defend himself. But Vic was right with what he said in episode 4. Claudia was exactly like their father. You still sound exactly like him. I am nothing like our father. Claudia is manipulative, power hungry, and she will do whatever it takes to become the queen, even if it means setting up her own family to be assassinated. A devil in a red dress, which is something I've mentioned in recent times for both Rock and Monet. And so speaking of Claudia in the same vein, really is saying something. Now, in a turn of events, Vic turned to AUSA Stacy Marks. He was willing to give up his sister because he wanted to see her suffer and rot in prison for the rest of her life. Because one, he made a promise to Gloria that he would get out of the game, and two, he was sick and tired of betrayal and manipulation from his own family. 
However, Claudia was just a starter for Stacy Marks. As we established before, she plays chess, not checkers, and so she wanted the main course. In exchange for immunity, she wanted Vic's help to bring down the CBI, Tommy Egan, and in turn, the entire drug trade in Chicago, which Vic Flynn agrees to. He just agreed to becoming a snitch, and we all know what happens to those in power, especially when you snitch on Tommy Egan. So at some point in season 2, will we also be saying goodbye to Victor Flynn?